What's up guys? I guess it's time to talk about 68 Cornet. Bigfoots and Mopars has been bugging me to, to tell this story for a long time. And I just haven't had the time to get to it. So, here we go. Um, this would have been after 96, before 2000, so late 90s. Um, back then, Craigslist didn't exist, or if it did, I didn't know about it. It was the recycler. And I can't remember if, um, if it came out every week or every month, whatever it was. You know, you get it at AM, PM, or liquor stores, or, you know, even grocery stores, I think, had it. But everybody, like, clamored to get them and see what kind of deals they could find. So I grabbed this recycler going through there. There it is, 68 Dodge Coronet. Uh, I think it said wrecked or something like that. 500 bucks. And I thought, man, that seems okay. You know, whatever. It was all the way in Los Angeles. So where I live, it's Riverside County. Uh, probably, probably an hour and a half to a two hour drive to get there. So it was a little too far. So whatever. Just kind of glazed back by it. The next recycler that came out was still in there. And I'm like, man, I could just feel the itch. Like I should call on this thing. I should you know check on this car um, so I didn't do anything I don't I think it was like the third week or the third issue of the recycler so maybe it was the third month I don't I don't really remember how often they came out but it was still in there and I thought man I can't believe the car is still there and I must have had the money or something so I decided to finally call a uh, girl answers the phone <clears throat> <clears throat> um, she says that yeah it was a, it was involved in a wreck she said it was her baby um, her dad helped her put the car together and she drove it and uh, he painted it for her and stuff like that and it was like her daily driver car had a little two barrel 318 in it uh, and its original paint coat is UU1 which is this bright blue metallic um, when I got the car it wasn't this paint job it was all dull and oxidized and stuff and that was its second paint job you know at the original paint then that paint job this is the third paint job so I asked I, I go it says it's wrecked like how bad is it and she says oh it's totaled and I'm like damn and I'm like man it's kind of far to go all the way for a total car and uh, uh, so I said okay so when you got in the accident so what happened was she said a Cadillac ran a red light um, and it clipped the front of the car so on the front of the car well I'll get into that but basically it hit the front of the car and she said the lady was drunk and uh, and I said okay I go well so you had to trailer the car or the tow truck take the car away from the accident and she goes no I drove it and I'm like Oh really and I was like well I go how bad I mean how bad could it be if you drove it I go was did it dump fluids or anything you know something can radiator into the fan and or, or uh, fan into the radiator and she said uh, no wasn't dripping any fluids I'm like how bad could it be you know and I'm like well is it knocking or anything so I'm thinking like the fan in the radiator making noise it just hasn't broken through yet and she goes, yeah, it's making a knocky noise. And I go, okay. And she says, the battery's dead, so if you want to come look at it, you got to bring your own battery or whatever. So I was like, all right. So I got hold of my dad and had him drive me out there. Um, I knock on the front door. And she answers the door. She wasn't bad looking. Uh, she goes, yeah, it's right around the corner. It's right around the back. So I walk around the property to the back gate. And as I'm walking around, I'm looking at the car and I'm like, holy shit, it's pretty clean. I mean, it, it was definitely hit up front. The front bumper was pushed over. The grill, you know, the vertical part of the grill was like twisted like this. And then one fender was like buckled out where the wheel well opening is because it had been pushed, you know. The hood still looks straight. So I get in there, I pop the hood 
and I'm looking around, fan's not hitting the radiator. The fan shroud had broken, so it flexed and the fan shroud broke, and a piece had fallen to the bottom of the shroud where the fan was hitting it. So I took that out, put the battery in it, threw a lot of little gas down the carburetor, got inside the car, fired right up. Uh, and she said you could take it for a test drive, you know? So I drove it around the block, and I was like, man, I mean, the thing was just, it was a cream puff. It just it ran like a champ, and it just rode great, you know? So I went up to her and paid her 500 bucks. Thanks, and she goes, she goes, oh, I would've took less. <laughs> I was like, it's all good. I mean, running, driving car, even for the late 90s, that was still a pretty good price. So I drove it home from LA. Uh, I was driving it as a daily driver for a long time. I was a charger guy, so I wasn't really into it that much, you know? It was just sort of my beater car. Uh, then at some point, the, uh, the 318, the original 318 gave up the ghost. I think it dropped a cylinder and it, the power just fell way off, you know, and it was pumping oil into the exhaust. So I was like, all right. So I pulled that motor out. I think I put another 318 in it for a while and then that motor died also. So a little later on, I picked up a 68 Dodge, or I, uh, in the recycler, there was a 68 Dodge Coronet in there, um, 383 automatic car, Coronet 500, uh, but was wrecked. <laughs> Another wrecked one. You know, and of course, I'm like, man, if it's anything like this one, I'm on it. So I called, and the guy's like, yeah, it's total, dude. Like, he says the car, it was his father-in-law's car, original owner and he drove it off a cliff and he rolled the car over. So he's like, "There's, it's it's just totally beat all the way around. And I'm like, all right. And he goes, but you know, it's good for parts, good for drivetrain parts. And I said, well, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a drivetrain to put into my Cornet. So drove down there. Uh, he, he actually was a body shop. Uh, he owned a body shop. So give you an idea, you know, he if he can't fix it, nobody can, you know. So I get there. I walk inside and I'm like, yeah, I'm here to check out that Coronet. And he goes, yeah. I go, well, where's it at? And he goes, you walked right by it. I was like, what? I turned around, go back out there. And yeah, sure enough, I walked right by it. Didn't even recognize it as a Coronet. That's how bad it was. It was smushed so bad. I actually thought it was a Firebird, you know, wrecked Firebird. But um, yeah, it was, that was the car. So I think that car was 300 bucks. So I went ahead and paid the guy 300 bucks. I don't, I don't remember if, uh, if he started it up for me or not there. You know, it, it was running and driving. You could tell by the car, like, yeah, this car had just been, it'd been on the street recently. You know, this accident just happened. So I think it sat for a few months. So uh, I drug it home. Uh, I just put like a 455 purple shaft cam in there. You know, like the Roadrunner Charger stock cam, pretty mild headers on it switched it to it it was a two barrel originally so I put a four barrel on it and electronic ignition dropped it in the car and then rolled it man the thing hauled ass it was actually that was a fast 383 for a stock car you know it, it would rip the tires pretty good so I was pretty happy with it um, drove it for a while it leaked a little bit of oil from the rear main seal and it had the rope seal in it you know, it was still the original rope seal and stuff. And so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll fix that. I'll drop the pan, change the rear main. So I did, and it leaked worse. Like, shit. You know, and everybody give you their advice and they tell you, like, oh, well, did you put the seal in the right way? Maybe it's facing the wrong way. And I'm like, oh, I'm sure I did. But I double checked. I pulled the pan. Sure enough, it's in there right. And people are saying, like, well, what if the seal try moving the seal like at a 45 degree ang angle so when you put the top seal in you crank it over you know you slide it over I did all that you know because they're saying that it will leak because it's at the same seam as the rear cap right the main seal cap nothing nothing fixed it and I put I tried like all kinds of different materials and stuff and it didn't make any difference I must have pulled a pan on that car like six times trying to make this work. I was so mad, so frustrated. Um, 
and I figured it, it's just got to have a rope seal for whatever reason, you know. Um, so the last time I dropped the pan, for whatever reason, I don't know why I did it, but I took a, a screwdriver and I put it between the main cap and the crank and I just pried on it and the whole crank just went ka-chunk and then I pried it the other way and it went ka-chunk and it was just like chunk, chunk, chunk. I mean, the end play on it was probably like 30 thousandths easily. I mean, it was moving a lot. So I was like, all right. Even though the thing ran like, like a badass, you know, it was just wore out. The motor was just wore out. It had who knows how many miles on it. It was, this guy had been rolling it since it was new in, in the car that he wrecked. So anyway, that kind of, that kind of did it for me. Um, I was like, all right, I gotta, now it's time to build it. So by that time I'd met my buddy, John Jones, and uh, I, I got a, I bought a 71 Polara that had a blown, it threw a rod, but it had a 440 in it. And I pulled that 440 and took it to the machine shop to have built and everything. And so I was building that motor for the Cornet. And then I met John. So I was, I'm a charger guy and I just met John. So I didn't know how good his work was, even though he'd showed me some cars and looked really nice. I figured I'd give him the Coronet to paint first, and if he did a good job on that, then I'd give him a Charger, right? So uh, I gave him the, I took the Coronet apart, pulled the 383 out of it, took it to him. He painted it, got the 440 built and stuff. When I got the the, the Coronet back, you know, I started putting it all back together. This was also about the time I picked up my 71 Polara because when I took this car apart, I needed, you know, I needed wheels. It was dumping oil so bad now, like it was practically undrivable. Um, I'd wish I left the, the rope seal in it because at least it would have been, it, it was leaking, but at least it would have been drivable. So, um, so anyway, that Polara became my daily driver until this car got put back together. And then, you know, met my wife, uh, we moved in together and uh, things slowed down quite a bit. The car just like I'd slowly work on it here and there and then we um, Bought a house together and I finished putting the car together then and um, That's when I started, you know, running it at the track and stuff Johnny, let's play here with this camera. that's pretty much the story I mean so it's got a 440 in it I put Edelbrock RPM heads on it it's got an RPM uh, performer intake manifold it's got TTI headers the TTI headers fit the car it fit the 440 and a B body go figure um, aluminum radiator it still runs hot like when I drive it in hot days it, it still overheats and stuff so it's more of a winter car, um, but eight and three quarter, 355 Sure Grip, uh, 727 automatic. I put a Frank Lupo dynamic converter in this car, 
and man what an awesome converter I'd read so much stuff about them I finally bought one and they're not cheap but um, I want to say it's probably like so like if the if the converter is and I can't even remember what the stall is on it I want to say it's like around 35 3800 rpm but it engages way like if you're just driving it on the street it engages way uh, you know sooner like at a lower rpm so if I just put it in drive and just cruise or whatever it's not like the engines going what? like a typical loose converter you know it revs up really high and then the car starts to move which is kind of kind of sucks like for daily use on the street um, now this thing this thing acts more like a normal converter um, I think they say about 300 rpms lower but it seems like it's a lot more than that the car is extremely drivable so um, not really freeway flyer I mean I could go down the freeway but with 355s it's when you're just three speed you know so the thing is screaming if you if you as soon as you get up to around 80 miles an hour the motor's humming you know but uh, yeah that's my uh, that's my cornet story um, oh so I guess kind of backtracking I had to replace the fenders on the car, the front bumper, the bumper brackets, the grill, and uh, surprisingly enough, even in the late late 90s, it was really hard finding fenders for this car. Like it was already hard finding charger parts, but I couldn't find fenders for shit. It took me a long time. Uh, finally found some and uh, threw them on the car to roll it. So, oh, the track. Uh, so I've only ran it in the eighth mile. I ran it at Qualcomm uh, and down in San Diego, and I've ran it in Paris. And both tracks, they went. The car went eight one. So they're kind of crappy tracks. And my Roadrunner is kind of built similar, you know. And I think it's similar in weight. I never weighed this car, but my Roadrunner weighs thirty four hundred pounds. It has cast iron heads on it, uh, and it went. 8.6 and then went 8.1 at Irwindale so potentially this car can go about a half second faster you know like the Roadrunner uh, just because the car the Roadrunner didn't really have traction until it got to a really sticky track like Irwindale so um, so I anyway, know maybe maybe some Caltrack bars and uh, a stickier track would make it go quicker but it's it's a full body car the only thing light on it is the heads water pump housing um, and the fiberglass hood it's got a six-pack hood scoop on it so I hope that satisfies you uh, Bigfoot it's a pretty quick story but that's my 68 coronet story so we'll walk through it walk around it real quick I don't know how well the lighting's gonna be I'll show you the motor it's not it's not clean it's 440 like I said came out of a 71 Monaco before I rebuilt it TTI headers are two inch tubes the exhaust on this thing is three inch I've got uh, flow masters on it dual chambers so Mopar electronic ignition I got a few things I gotta finish up on it. Someday I will. Maybe. <laughs> so I still have the original California plates. Came with the car. Like I said, it's UU1. It's a bench seat car, white interior. Dash is all still pretty original. Got some, you know, I think it's got some cracks and stuff. You can kind of see a little dingy and stuff, but I still got to put the trim back on it. And it's got a lot of Bondo in these quarter panels, but like I said, I didn't really care about the car. When I had John work on it, I said, I just want it 
decent so I can drive it and look halfway decent. When I got the car back, I was like, holy shit, this thing is actually pretty nice. <laughs> so it's kind of a new experience when you uh, first get a car painted and somewhat nice. And by no means do I think my car is like really nice and restored, but it's the nicest thing I've got. Uh, but you kind of go through anxiety, you know, driving the car, leaving the car anywhere. You're afraid somebody's gonna, you know, rip it off. Freaking spider webs. Or somebody's gonna wreck into it, you know. Oh, and it was, it was a, if you see these, they only put these on vinyl top cars. This is actually a vinyl top car, but I took the trim off and uh, I think I had John weld it up. I might have welded it up. I don't remember. But it's a pretty solid California car. Doesn't have any rust issues. Just has, I mean, if I was to ever restore this car again correctly, which will never happen, I've got too many, too many other cars to worry about. But you know, the quarter panels will probably have to get cut off and then re-welded on. Oh, and this is a this is a 440 model. So it had like this trim along the top of the quarter panel and the door and the fender. I took all that off and welded the whole shut. And it had, it said Coronet 440 over here, welded all that shit shut. So it's just really plain Jane looking. It's kind of like a Super B, but, but not even a Super B. So, it's very plain. It's my dash. And no headliner. My headliner is trashed. <laughs> someday, someday I'll put it in. And right now it's got something clunking around in the back. I think it's a U joint, but I don't know. It could be something going on with the, the third member. I mean, I could still run it and drive it. I'm a little reluctant to take it apart, but I just need to get a third member ready so it's just a swap and then, and you know, some U joints and roll it. So, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little story of my 68 Coronet. Um, you got any questions or stories of your own? Definitely say something in the comments, and uh, we'll catch you on the next video. So I thought of something else on the 68 Coronet story, uh, something that the previous owner said when I was talking to her on the phone. Um, by the way, I think it was every week the recycler came out, so it was probably the third week that I finally called on the car. And 
One thing she told me was that a guy with a 68 Super B came and looked at the car because he was looking he was looking to buy it for parts for his Super B. And he came and looked at it and he told her the car was too nice to use for parts for the Super B and passed for that reason. And uh, I want to say thanks to that guy. <laughs> I appreciate him, you know, kind of recognizing the car and and deciding to not buy it to part out and you know whatever save his B and then the process sacrifice cornet um, but it kind of brings back to like just how things were back then you know these cars were dirt cheap still they were plentiful and you know there's a good chance like that girl you know to her it was a total car because she had no know-how or ability to fix the car didn't know where to turn for parts or anything you know if that guy didn't buy it and I didn't buy it and you know if nobody else were to step up and buy the car there's a good chance that this car would have ended up in a boneyard somewhere and I've seen cars that were in similar condition in the boneyard and you ask yourself like why in the hell is this car in here it's because the person that owns the car or owned the car didn't see any value in it like they didn't know that there's a following for these cars there's guys out there that would love to have this car and be able to fix it up you know they just saw it as it's just a car you know these cars were still being driven around that time not not all over the place but you would still see them on the road and in this particular case this car was a daily driver car it was on the streets it wasn't for car shows it wasn't to go hot rodding it was a daily driver just like your Toyota Corolla or your Honda Accord, like it's an A to B car, you drove it. And so uh, a lot of these cars hit the boneyard because the person that owned them was, well, it's a daily driver, it got wrecked, I'm done, and I'm not gonna pay money to fix it. It's not worth a lot of money, and boom, into the boneyard. It's a good it thing this car squeezed by that era and survived and you know it's precious to me and I cherish it and I think you know the world is you know when I take it out and driving and stuff I get thumbs ups and everything so I think everybody appreciates that it survived but anyway it was just like a interesting afterthought after I recorded before uh, so something else I thought of too was uh, uh, go check out my buddy uh, Muscle City Madness he's got a cool road runner and uh, 72 three or four Challenger I'm not sure what year it is the Roadrunner is super cool and to my dismay and surprise this last video I just saw him doing he's actually gonna sell the car he's put it up for 18,000 I think it was um, but go check him out I'll put a little you know something so you know what his page or his uh, YouTube channel looks like all right that's it see you guys